Hey, you're listening to season two of the Residence Podcast, supported by the University of Bristol, the University of the West of England and the Watershed. In 2020, we released a series to help capture some of the source behind the double doors that lead into the wonderful world of the Pervasive Media Studio, and we're back with some more conversation and some more games. On this show, we let the community from the Pervasive Media Studio share a bit about themselves and what the space is really like. We learn a bit about what makes them tick and what brought them to the PM studio. Then once all that pretty stuff is out of the way, we play a little game, getting them to think outside the box. In some cases, smashing the box to pieces. In this season, we try and put our guests through the mill, but it's no fun without our community getting involved. So keep up to date by following us on social media, at PM Studio on Twitter and Pervasive Media Studio on Instagram. It'd be great to hear some of your thoughts on the moral quandaries our guests have to answer. So, if you're a new listener, I'm your host, Prince Taylor. I've been a resident at the PM Studio since 2018 and had the pleasure of getting to develop my work in an environment with countless inspirational people, some of whom you're going to meet this series. This is the Not Your Shoe Size episode, and I'm joined by Tim Kinberg and Constance Flurio who both share a very unique perspective on the Pervasive Media Studio, having both worked with HB Labs, who were part responsible for piloting the methodology which became central to the studio's inception. We discover some more unconventional routes into a freelance career in the creative sector, as well as exploring the barriers and opportunities ageism can present in the tech industry. Hey, you're listening to Will Taylor, um, and I'm joined here by Constance and Tim, two of our fine wine resonance. Let's put it that way. <laughs> oh, we, we've been chatting so much just before we start recording, so we're kind of like in a bit of a funny mood for this one. But without further ado, I, I'm going to hand the mic over and allow you to introduce yourselves. Hi, I'm Tim Kinberg. I've been a resident of the studio for a very long time. I was around when the studio was created because I worked for HP Labs, which was one of the organisations that kicked off the studios to begin with. And it was mainly colleagues of mine who, who founded it. My background's in technology. I was an academic computer scientist many years ago, and I mainly build technology mainly for creative purposes, not always creative purposes nowadays. And that's me, really. Um, I'm a bit of a geek, but I'm also a writer, mainly where my creative expression is. And I like to work with creative types. That's why I'm in the studio. I'm Constance Flurio, and like Tim, I did actually work at HP Labs. I've just remembered I was employed there. So my background is pretty varied. I did a fine art degree as a mature student when I had three kids. And after that, I did a master's in IT at at UE because it was a women-only one. And they paid you your social security plus £10 a week, plus your bus fare, plus childcare. So I thought, oh, okay, I'll do that. I got into using computers at the end of my fine art degree. We used to sneak into a room where they had these Apple Macs that were very basic and use them to make images with. And that's how I sort of got into computers. So we're talking sort of 1992, before people had them at home, basically. You know, I just do different stuff depending on whether I need to earn money and whether I'm interested in things. Mm -hmm. So I'm sort of one of those people who doesn't have a particular set of skills. (laughs) (laughs) Love that. Love that. I can relate to that. I can definitely relate to that, boy. (laughs) Yeah, I don't recommend it if you want to have lot, earn lots of money, though. But it does make life more interesting. And also, having five kids, you've got to be able to fit. Mm. Or I, I had to fit around them, really, yeah. as well. So, yeah. And now I'm now that they've all left home, I can sort of... I've got a bit more freedom to work out what I want to do. Yeah. That's, that's but, dope. But then again, when you, you know, having just hit 60, it might be a little bit too late, really, because I'm at the age where people think you're going to retire or they think you've got lots of experience at something. Mm. But actually, the things I want to do, I don't have experience in. Mm-hmm. So I'm like a newcomer to lots of different stuff. Mm. But 
people make the assumption when you're older that you're not learning new things, but that you've got lots of experience in it. Mm. You know, mm. if you, you know, it's like I could apply for an apprenticeship, but people might laugh. You know, it's that sort of thing. That's their problem, isn't it? That's not, that's not your problem, no? <laughs> well, it is if I can't get the, the roles I want. Of course, want. of course, of course. But it is, that, it is that thing. So like when you were saying earlier about us being mature, I don't feel as though I'm necessarily mature, but sort of my age might get in the way of me doing things I'm interested in because I'm always interested in lots of different stuff. Yeah, yeah. See, that's, that's, um, that's something I'm finding really interesting at the moment, actually, in terms of the type of work that I'm doing. Like working with Rising Arts Agency, having been on the Digital Placemaking Fellowship, a lot of my thinking was centered around sort of like young people and young people's opinions, uh, young people's perspectives of Bristol's cultural offering. But the types of conversations that we were having were moving into spaces that were looking at their overall experience of their life and it became apparent to me that it's impossible to paint that full picture without making the conversation intergenerational because these young people have learned stuff from somebody from somewhere i mean i mean let's be clear to for someone to be a, in a technical career and to be actually doing technical stuff writing software doing r d at my age i'm 63 um i'm not supposed to be doing it yes so i'm supposed to have stopped doing that when i was 30. You know, and I haven't. I've done it actually just to establish my vintage uh, constants. You, I, I see, I see your 1992 yes. constants, and I raise you 1975, which is when I first programmed a computer. And I've been doing it since then. Oh, hang on, hang on. I've been doing it since then. And um, you know, I'm. Okay. Okay, when Just I, before we... I know, when I was at school doing math, they told, they told no, no, us no, no, no. we had to do our <laughs> multiplying our dy by dx matrices stuff, and we were told they'd be useful for when we worked in computing. So that's what I was doing in 75. Yeah. Oh, okay, well, if we're talking math, I'm going back <laughs> yeah. to the 1960s, man. Oh, stop this. Stop it. Stop it. You know, you know that's, you know, that's yeah. like mad, yeah? The... See, I, I, blew, I blew my career in maths by having children instead, but that's a whole other story. Anyway, sorry, Tim, I'll shut up and let you carry no. on. So you were programming yeah, yeah, back I mean, then. <laughs> I mean, the thing is that I'm, you know, I'm not supposed to be, I mean, I, I definitely have not witnessed any decline in the rate at which I need to learn new stuff. I mean, I'm constantly learning new stuff. I still mm. write software. I'm always, I'm always um, learning new stuff about different frameworks and things. Um, I'm solving problems. I'm thinking about information systems related to sustainability at the moment. I never thought about that before. I'm having to figure that out, you know, from scratch and... I'm constantly learning new things. I always, I always get a bit annoyed with people who are about 50 and, and sort of act like they can't possibly handle any kind of technical information whatsoever. I just think, why not? I mean, do it. Come on, get a handle on it. Yes. You know? You're only 50, for Christ's sake. <laughs> do you mean those people who... who uh, I tell you, the one that really annoys me, though, is the one where people do a presentation and they always use their grandmothers or their mothers as yeah, examples exactly. of people who don't know what the exactly. hell is going on. I nearly swore there, yeah. but I didn't. <laughs> but yeah, that whole thing. Yeah. There, was, there was actually, there was one of those sandboxes that Watershed or Studio did a while back. And one of the, one of my, uh, you know, a woman who I'd worked with was in one of the groups and the, the, the young thrusty guy was talking about, well, it's not like we can give grannies mobile phones and they go out yeah. on their bicycles to record yeah. it. Because he was sort of implying that women who are grandmothers, A, didn't know how to use a mobile phone, and B, were too old to bicycle anywhere. And I just wanted to shout, you know, you can be a grandmother when you're 33, for Christ's sake, and still be legal in this country. It's like this assumption that all grandparents are ancient, just, you know. Um, and then also the assumption that women don't know how to use a mobile phone. And it was just that all those levels of assumption that you encounter. And this was at a watershed thing mm. where everyone was being really right on, except when it came to older women. Anyway, and older so, people in general, yeah, right? So those, are, those are, are, we're supposed to not, not be able to handle things like mobile phones, right? You know, we're supposed to be all flummoxed yeah. when we see an app. You know, just, I mean, give me yeah. a break. Yeah. yeah. I did notice, yeah. actually, there was an advert for Nintendo DS, and the granddad was playing and thrashing the kid oh, right. at the game. Yes. And I, and I just thought, actually, someone is picking up on this. Because one, one of the things I really am keen on is, like, this idea of people doing intergenerational stuff together. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's like, you know, I 
occasionally get to Skype or Zoom or whatever with my grandkids, and they really can't be bothered to talk to me. <laughs> really can't be bothered because you know they might come and stare at the screen a bit and then they're off. It's not it's not interesting or engaging mm -hmm. for them. And so that's one of the things I've been trying to think about is actually what games can you make that you can play with your grandkids remotely? Yeah. Because like I've got some in London, I've got some in the Netherlands. You know, how can I do something will actually engage them to play a game? And those sorts of ideas. But it's a really hard thing to explain to people. <laughs> Although I'm hoping it's going to be easier to explain now that we've all been in lockdown and lots of people have not been able to see their grandkids. Yeah. But the trouble is, I think, I think one of the issues as well is the gatekeepers of the funds or whatever, they tend not to be the grandparents or the young kids. They tend to be the, the guys in the middle yeah. who don't necessarily get it until it becomes part of their experience. Yeah. Forgive me, innit? Because like the latest point of reference you guys offered, yeah, 1992, I was one years old, innit? <laughs> <laughs> so I, 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 I'm, yeah. I'm still tripping. Like, I'm, I can't lie. I'm still tripping and being like, yo, like you was out well, here programming <laughs> stuff and like I couldn't, do you know what I'm saying? Like I couldn't figure anything out for myself. And there's this sort of, even like the way you both spoke about your careers before the PM studio and stuff like that. And this uh, almost like a horizon moment for both of you when you were like, actually, no, nah, I don't want to be working within an organization. I kind of like the freedom. I like the space and the engagement that working creatively offers me and there's this sort of like mythical thing, I guess that's happening for me right now, where it's like, right, you lot actually started something from nothing. Like it, it, it came from a couple of ideas and it's turned into this thing that when I moved to Bristol, the PM studio was this space where like anything was possible. Do you know what I mean? So I just, I just wanted to share that with you and, and then also move on to a, a, a thought about sort of like what, having seen how sort of like being involved actually in the way tech has developed in the creative sector in the southwest as well and like working closely with universities who then influence how thousands of people sort of view their careers and plan their careers what, what's your relationship with like ideation when you see new ideas come about like has there been something that's come about for you recently you're like oh they smacked that or something where you're just like I hope it works for them because I've seen someone try it before. Do you know what I mean? That's an interesting question, actually. I, I sort of feel, I mean, I've got to say, I feel a little bit out of the loop from the studio community just because of COVID. I mean, before COVID, I was there five days a week. You know, I was a, I was a mm. resident and I would know what a lot of people were doing. But the reality now, although I have snippets of what other people are doing, I don't really know anything like... Um, the same degree what people are up to um i do see i'm i'm a technology skeptic and i do okay. see i do see you know like nfts for example just make me um somewhat <laughs> cross um <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> a lot of what people say ai can do makes me cross somewhat cross you know mm. so i I feel I, I come very much from a place where I'm not I'm not impressed at all by technology as such. I'm only <laughs> I'm only impressed with people doing really um, amazing things with it that I you know that that that's kind of in a different direction to the technology itself. It utilizes the technology, but it's not really about the technology. Um, mm. I, I sort of feel I feel like I want to I want to resist. The lure of technology uh, in our lives to be honest with you i mean the only technology uh, i just feel it doesn't solve problems in the way a lot of people it solves so think it solves problems per se it just doesn't you know we we have a lot of human challenges at the moment and there are any human solutions to those some there are aspects of technology in it but, I, but they're not really technology is not really the point it's how we organize ourselves yeah. it's how we think about things in new ways those, those, that's where the real creativity needs to come in, right? In this particularly challenging time we're in at the moment. Mm. I suppose, yeah, I would, I would agree with you, Tim. I would also say that there are some old ways of thinking that are still useful. Mm. <laughs> I was just thinking yeah. about bell hooks dying, <sighs> and it just had me thinking about yeah. what an important voice she was yeah. way back, mm. you know, and the things that people like her were saying. 
you know, so those, you know, those are old ways of looking at things, if you like. I mean, you know, going back a couple of, a few decades, those are old ways of looking at things that are still relevant and useful today if people listen to those voices. Yeah. So again, it's like, I agree with you that technology doesn't solve things. Technology can sometimes share the ideas more quickly, yeah. but it doesn't necessarily share the good ideas more quickly. Mm. But yeah, some of, those, some of those voices that have been around for a long time that we can look back on and think, well, how can we use technology to get these ideas across or to use these ideas to inform our creative work, you know? It's not so much, I'm not sure it's old ways of thinking, but just the currents of things that have been just going on forever, you know, like in those sorts of yeah. inequalities that you're talking about. And technology has nothing whatsoever to say about those things. Art does, right? Art reflects on those things. But technology itself is not any kind of panacea to those embedded social injustices, you know, and, and, you know, it's not, you can decentralize tech and it still doesn't make everything all right, you know, like all the lots of people. Yeah. And, um, but art does, I mean, that's very much a, that's one of the things I liked. I mean, when I contrast, because I also worked for HP Labs in California for four years and um, it was so different, the culture of tech development being in Silicon Valley to what I saw going on in Bristol. And I found the Bristol approach to things quite appealing because we were we were doing technologies which you know at a corporate level could be kind of boasted about and and videos made of it and stuff and it all was going to look very shiny and silicon valley type stuff but it wasn't really and it and, and it was supposedly technology for cities and it was in a sense but nobody ever thought about how you actually go about embedding technologies in cities what that would mean you know, who would be able to access those technologies, where it would be, what sort of spaces those would be, who would be in those spaces. No one ever thought about those kinds of things. And I think mm. if you um, look more at the kind of work that goes on in the studio and, and actually went on in HP Labs in Bristol before that, there's a lot more concern um, because of people like Constance being involved with... Mm. The relationship between those technologies and people's lives and that's you know that's much more it's so much more interesting actually you know than the technology itself often th is, so. yeah. and also thinking about it the people so phil stenton and alison kidd who are the two that sort of spring to mind because those were the the two people i worked you know i worked on alison's kids in alison kids team which is the one that Joe Reed and Richard Hull were in, and then working with Phil as well. And, and Alison and Phil were from a psychology background. They weren't from a technological background. They, they had their first degrees were in psychology. So they were very interested in people and how people use technology and things like that. And I think, yeah, it was, a, you know, it was quite a privilege to work in that sort of team of people where it's a mixture of engineers and psychologists. And then, then yeah. And artists, well, right? I mean, that. that's, that, 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 there was that yeah. integration of working with artists that I always found very interesting as a concept. Yeah, so that was something that developed from yes. that. So when we were looking at the... Yeah, so I introduced that team to um, a small number of artists in Bristol who I knew to, to develop work around sort of deconstructing these small screens, you know, mm. so... And then that also led to running some sessions with John Dovey on the language, the emerging language that we were using around mm. pervasive technology or, or mobile technology, which is what we were calling it at the time. Mm. And so we ran those workshops with John Dovey. And that, again, sort of developed into a whole strand of research that John is still um, involved yeah. with. Um, and that was bringing together all sorts of interesting people from Watershed, BBC, uh, computer science backgrounds and artists yeah. and it was interesting because um, um when we were made redundant we weren't made redundant by the bristol management we were made redundant by the american management because the americans couldn't get this get their heads around this at all i mean they they were now sitting in silicon valley very much what i would now describe as tech bro tech bro culture you know they couldn't mm -hmm. conceive mm -hmm of anything, any value outside the technology they were building. They really just didn't think of that at all. And they just looked at what we were doing in Bristol, because I then moved to Bristol, and just couldn't make head or tail of it, really. They couldn't understand why mm. we weren't designing algorithms or, 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 you know, which we were, but 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 in, the, in a context that made them meaningful. Yeah. And uh, that's, why, that's why they fired 70 of us, because, we, because they couldn't, 
<laughs> get their heads around it, you know. Do you, do you believe it's possible for tech to remain ethical as well as hit a worldwide market? Does, does that seem possible to you? I think it's unintended consequences, isn't it? I don't think the people who design, I mean, well, you could, the people who design social media platforms, they weren't sort of thinking evil thoughts when they did that. They weren't thinking, <laughs> under my, let's under... Oh, I don't know. The well, Facebook, maybe Facebook some, was pretty well, evil thought, yeah. wasn't it? I mean, basically, it was rating yeah, girls I on agree. campus. I agree That's about that. But they what weren't I would thinking, call a let's undermine good idea. Democ- democracy, shall we? You know, and, and it's... No, that, that came, came later. Well, <laughs> that came later. Yeah, you're right. I mean, but I don't think, you know, I, but, but nobody... Once it started doing it, they weren't bothered about changing no, it, though, were they? Nobody, nobody could have said back then that that's what, that was something that would have happened, I don't think. They're, those were emergent yeah. properties of technology and, you know, that... But that's always yeah. happened, hasn't it? I mean, the whole thing with mobile phones and text messaging. Text messaging wasn't the feature of mobile yeah. phones. You know, that was just in there so that they could test systems and things. But uh, one of the people I worked with at uh, Intel Research, they were doing, uh, uh, we were interviewing teenage girls about their use of phones and things like that. But they're saying that basically, if you want to look for the early adopters in technology, then look at what teenagers are doing, especially teenage girls, because they're very social. Mm-hmm. And so that whole thing with text messaging was sort of the growth of it was driven. They, they did studies in Japan where it was driven by teenage girls messaging each other. And that was a completely unintended thing. But, you know, I mean, we've moved on a bit from text messaging now because we've got all the other different things we mm. use. But um, I just remember thinking that was interesting that that teenagers were using it in a way that wasn't expected. But then telephones, you know, when they were first invented, people were told not to use them for chatting on. You know, they were meant to be a business thing. But in terms of ethics, though, right, I mean, on a scale from Facebook to, not Facebook, I don't know, text messaging to um, killer robots. I mean, killer robots are, (laughs) you know, right there, you've got ethical dimensions to the tech, you know, manifest ethical dimensions to the technology as constructed. And, yeah. um, but, but I think a lot of the time, the, the tech, you know, the, there's a much more, much greater degree of indirection between the technology and the ethical issues, um, you know, because it's really about how people are using it and, you know, people's just not getting that they have certain ethical dimensions they're not even thinking about when they design it, you know. Whereas with killer robots, I'm designing a killer robot to kill people. You know, but if I'm designing <laughs> Facebook, um, yeah, I mean, like the morality behind Facebook is completely questionable. You're right, you're right, um, Constance. But it, um, but but a lot of the, a lot of the dimensions that, that that have come to light about Facebook, you know, they weren't thinking of that when they designed it. But it's emerged because of the inter- the, the social interactions via those technology platforms have become things that none of us really. I don't think anyone really predicted to, in the severity that, that they've arisen. Well, the wisdom in this episode is an absolute vibe. From what I've gathered, we all have some ethical responsibility over how tech is developed for a global market. And I'm definitely going to start referring to my experience in a certain practice as my vintage. Yes, hold tight Tim for that one. Next up, we've got the moral quandary section. Our little game where we explore the little cheeky monkey and us all waiting to be called into the limelight. So the way this works is that we have four topics for our guests to choose from. They'll read out a question from the topic of choice and offer their answer. The group can deliberate or offer their own answers too. We've also added a wild card into this series so they can answer a question not immediately related to the topics we provided. There are no right or wrong answers, or winners or losers, just masters of mayhem. So hit us up on social media to share some of your responses to the questions asked. Let's go. So, Tim has nominated himself to go first. What category would you like, Tim? I would like wild card. Are you guys straight into the deep end, baby? <laughs> That's the way I do things. <laughs> He's just so wild. <laughs> sick, sick. The aliens have landed and you now have to choose one of our guests to lip sync a song to show them that we want peace and not war. Who do you pick and what song would you give them? <laughs> I'm already working out a little sweepstick in my head as to what 
what who with um what artist you're gonna pick <laughs> well i mean it sounds a bit obvious really but i you know give peace a chance by john lennon it's got to be the one oh, i think yes. and um will i think you got to be john lennon for us today <laughs> i would give that full beans <laughs> i would give that full beans yeah 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 it's a good one to learn for whenever you're on a protest yeah <laughs> sick, sick. it's a classic for a reason it's very straightforward to yeah, sing in a really. crowd you got, you got me inspired now man. you got me inspired are we, are we playing that one in the shower making sure i'm memorizing those words just in case uh, give peace yeah. a chance yeah you just need the chorus that's all you need really yeah yeah it's interesting uh, because I've, I'm writing another book at the moment. I'm always writing something, but um, which involves aliens landing in Bristol trying to make head or tail of this, actually. Yeah. Um, yeah. Hey. yeah. <laughs> while, we, while we're busy trying to destroy ourselves. Yeah. <laughs> oh, my God. So I thought you might have gone for a, a David Bowie number there. but. Mm. Um, yeah, I could have gone for a David Bowie number, but it'd have been a bit a bit harder to think of, I think, and on the short shrift. So, yeah. 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 In terms of a one that wants peace yeah. not war, yeah. Okay, Constance, what what category would you like? Um, I'm going to have to go wild card as well. I'm afraid. Wild card. Am I allowed well. a wild card as well? Yeah, of course, of course. Only because I I find it really hard to make a decision. All right, all right, that's cool. I got you. As you I'll can tell you. from looking at my so-called career. <laughs> uh. Oh, okay. Oh my. Um, okay, so my wild card question is: Would you rather that every significant decision you make will be decided by a live audience or by rock paper scissors? Basically, I already do the live audience because whenever I have a significant decision to make, I will go on and on and on about it to my mates, to my sisters, to my kids. Um, I might not listen to anything that they say, <laughs> but it's almost like I have to say it out loud to lots and lots of people and then completely ignore them. <laughs> so I suppose it's not being decided by an audience, but there is always an audience. There's yeah. usually an audience to my significant decisions yeah. because it takes me a while to, to work out what I actually want. Mm. And sometimes verbalizing it is a really good way of doing it or writing it down and thinking about it. Mm. And I think one of the things, well, there's a couple of things about when I was in my mid fifties and I got into doing Sudoku, this, this will make sense. Trust me. <laughs> I got into doing Sudoku and I suddenly realized as I was doing it, that it didn't matter if I got it wrong. And it was the first time in my life that I thought it was okay for me to get something wrong was doing this Sudoku because wow. you could just start again. Yeah. And I realized that my whole life I've been trying to, I've avoided making decisions in case I got it wrong. Yeah. I think for me, realizing that I can make a decision and things can go wrong, but it's okay. I'm still going to survive, mm -hmm. you know? And I think that sort of ties in with this thing of whenever I have a decision to make, I have to verbalize it. Mm. And it's sort of like, it's partly because I'm not allowing myself to think I can make the right decision on my own. Yes. Yeah, so for me, yeah, a live studio audience yeah. who can sort of help me arrive at the decision I want to arrive at anyway. I just need to learn to have a pretend live audience, yeah. if you like, in my head. That's the voices in my head, my live <laughs> audience. <laughs> Bless you. But rock, paper, scissors is too random. That's too... Yeah. Uh, yeah I, I don't I don't think so yeah yeah I feel you no honestly like I relate I relate a great deal to what you just shared as well I love starting something and going through that process of being an absolute novice and just having the permission to get it wrong and then I'll put it down after that because I'm like I've gone through that process of sort of like learning but then if it comes to making a big decision i'm the exact same as you i'm like calling everyone oh yeah like i want to chat like this and that like should i do this but what if it what if it does what if it did this and that and then and then eventually choose to or choose not to and then i'm like oh next thing i know i wake up like a few weeks later and i'm still having the same cereal like do you know what i mean like it's, it's the moments pass so I, th I think that thing as well as you get older there is a sort of a there is, there's also, it's also counterbalanced by this thing of thinking, right, I'm 60 now, I've probably got, well, 
who knows how much time I've got left. You're much closer to dying, basically, you know, and, you know, you can't say, oh, I'll, I can do this for the next 10 years with any certainty, yeah, 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 yeah. you know, especially if you look at when your parents, how old your parents were when they died or, yeah. you know, your friends start dying off and things like that. And so this sense of urgency can really get in the way of you thinking it's OK to make a dis uh, the wrong decision because I can I can do it again. Yeah. And sometimes and you get to this age and you think, oh, but can I do it again? Nice. You know, is this my last chance to do this? Is this my yeah. last, you know? And then the other part of you is thinking, should I just stop now because there's no point? Because oh, <laughs> wow. I'm never going to finish what I'm starting. And then you read about other people who had their first novel published when they're 70 or, yeah. you know, things like that. Or but someone else will finish it for you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. That was the creative control, wasn't it, right there? Oh, yeah. oh, 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 oh. I'm thinking, who do I trust? <laughs> <laughs> who do I trust to do yeah. that? Yeah, but there are, I mean, I'm sure you, you know, I don't know whether Tim suffers from that as well or whether he no, is immortal, but there is that. It's a really interesting point, really. It wasn't really a dimension I thought of when, when I saw that question. I mean, I was tempted to say rock, paper, scissors, because the, there's the famous Dice Man book, isn't there, where there's the guy who, yeah. who constantly yeah. tosses the dice to decide what to do. I could never, sometimes I'll do that, sometimes I will toss a coin, but... Um, my, it's called the I Ching, isn't it? <laughs> I, well, but I'd never actually make a decision. I have, to, I have done the I Ching just as a kind of creative spur. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. we all did, but didn't we? I not make a decision on the basis of <laughs> I that. I had the book. But I, but I do think that I, I tend to... I always say to myself, well, really, it's down to you in the end. You know, no one else is going to make the decision for you. And I, I sometimes I'll cut out the other people on that basis. And I'll just say, well, just go with what your gut says if you can't work it out. But but I mm -hmm. I'm I am you know I will definitely verbalize it to other people when I can though you know just to sort of hear myself say it and hear myself react to it you know and hear myself talking about the yeah. possibilities like I'm I'm with Constance because ultimately if it's an important decision I'm not let it's not going to be I'm just I'm not going to just go with what somebody else says you know it's got to make it's got to be meaningful to me but but you're right Constance yeah. that as you get older I mean I think you d I certainly did have a I mean, I'm past 60 now. I'm several years past 60, but I think when I became 60, you can't deny that you're old anymore, right? You just can't, you can't, it doesn't matter how young you feel. That is my face yeah, in the mirror. I mean, you can't, it doesn't matter how young you feel at heart or anything, you know, or how, how much of your abilities you still yeah. have. You, the fact is that, that arithmetic is against you at this point, right? And, and you know, there, there are only a certain number of years. And it does, it is a bit of a crisis, actually, for me, it was. And I think I'm kind of a bit over that now. And I, I think you can't, you, can't, you can't live your life by making everything you decide, like, it's got to be the right thing because cause I haven't got time to, to undo it. I, I think I just believe that I can always undo it for the rest of my life. You know, even if I'm gone in five days' time, I can still make a decision now and I can still undo, un, undo it in three days time you know I mean I'd, I'd rather have that attitude that I am very agile and I can change my mind you know <laughs> really yes. I'm agile and I can change my mind and I no, no 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 I was just thinking how non-agile I am these days but that's a completely well, yeah, different I mean, thing physically there are certain things you can't deny that <laughs> you know I'm not I, I, yeah I, yeah, you know, physically, I'm not the person I was when I was 20. I can't possibly be, and 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 I can't do everything I could do back then. But, but certainly in terms of my attitude to life, I'm, I think, if anything, more agile now than I was actually. I, I think I'm more capable of realizing I was wrong, or that it was wrong, or or you know, I need to do something different. You know, that 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 doesn't have to go. You know, I think I think for me because I had children before I was actually technically adult. I think that has definitely affected mm -hmm. some of the fears I've had about making decisions because it hasn't just been me that's been involved, you know, because I had, you know, three kids by the time I was 21 mm -hmm. to something like that, mm -hmm. you know, and I, so I've always had children, so I've always had to think about them mm -hmm. and... I mean, I haven't said, you know, obviously I haven't put them first all the time and I've still done stuff and made decisions to actually, if there's something I really want to do, I don't use ch having children as a reason for not doing it. Yeah. You know, because yeah. otherwise then you resent having children. So, you, mm -hmm. you know, you, you, have to, you have to sort of balance it for yourself. And, and again, it's, it's, again, it's that thing of making a conscious decision rather than a 
than than making a choice without realizing mm. you're making that choice yeah, if, yeah. if that makes sense so yeah. like you know i went and i left my kids in england for six months and i went to berlin and was an art student mm -hmm. and lots of people were like you did what mm -hmm. and it's like you know they're fine they're all grown up now they still talk to me mm -hmm. you know but at the time it wasn't really the done thing to do so it's like there have been decisions I've made which were pretty big ones, which were I have done it and nobody else has thought it was a good idea, but I've done it anyway. Mm -hmm. But it's just that that thing of on a day to day, part of me thinks maybe I lost that ability to do that. Mm -hmm. You know, that you know, that was the early nineties. I was much younger, I was much more determined, and I feel as though maybe some of that disappeared in my thirties and forties because I was then hung up with the thing of trying to find a job or being paid to do stuff and having teenagers and then having more children. Mm -hmm. All those sort of things can sort of overwhelm you a bit and then you start wondering whether you're making any good decisions at all, mm. <laughs> you know. But I feel as I'm coming out of it now, yeah. you know, finally, sort of. But then you're very, I'm very conscious of the, well, what are the things I still want to do? And I actually have to prioritise them because I can't do all of them. You know, yeah. I can still do quite a few things, but... If there's something I really want to do, I've just got to get on and do it now. And it's that realization when you've spent sort of 20 years or so prioritizing everybody else. And then, and also one thing I also realized I was doing in my working life was I was helping lots of other people develop their ideas and develop their projects. And I would put people in and say, oh, you should talk to so-and-so and you should talk to so-and-so. And all these people were doing stuff. And actually, and then I stood there thinking, hang on a minute, what about my creative practice? Because I'd been mothering for so long, it was like I was taking that into the workplace as well yeah. and just mothering people and listening to them. And actually my own stuff wasn't happening at all. So, you know, so that, that for me, I suppose, is my big shift at 60. Is like, actually, there's still things I want to do. And I, if I don't do them now, they're never going to happen. So I've got to actually think, well, I either don't do them and I don't cry about it, or I do them. Yeah, that's, ge that's genuinely really inspiring to hear, man, like make the decisions for yourself in the situation that you're in. Your priorities might shift and then to sort mm. of like recenter. That sounds like an admirable arc to me. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, I'd love to be able to be like at 60, just say like, actually, what do I want to do and what can I do? Like, yeah, like both of them things and be like, all right, yeah. cool, I'm, I'm, I'm going to do I'm going to do something. I think if you're a creative person and you stop being creative, that's when you start getting mental illness yeah, I feel and right. depression. Mm -hmm. And and so like every every week now I go and do a silver making course at uh, class. So mm. I go and hammer the shit out of lumps of metal yeah. and, you know, play with blow torches and, you know, make myself lots of jewelry. You know, I went and did it today and I was there from 10 till half two. And I didn't think about work and I didn't think about bills and I didn't think about kids or COVID or anything. Mm. I was so focused on just actually doing stuff with my hands. And I think for me, it's like I can't really afford to do it. Mm -hmm. But if I don't do it, yeah. then the other stuff gets a bit overwhelming, yeah. you know, and stuff I'm doing to earn money just gets a bit overwhelming. But mm. actually... I need something creative. And I'm sure Tim's the same, like with writing yeah, fiction. Yeah, I mean, that's my, <clears throat> my creative outlet mostly is, is well, I mean, I, I suppose writing software is creative in a different way, but, but right, I, I write. It's I, not personal yeah, it's not though, personal, is it? And I, I write, I write every morning. I discipline myself now to write every morning because it's good for me. Uh, you know, it's good yeah. for me to do that, to um, devote that time to like what's really wants to, emanate from from me in the in the particular circumstances i'm in you know and get it down on paper and it's i think it's really important it, it is really imp i don't know who else that's important to but i imagine it 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 should be it could be a really good part of everybody's life when they when they start to get to yes. our, our sort of age you know that that it doesn't matter what it is but it's um, it's about self-expression and you know you you it's not like you know exactly who you are. We still surprise ourselves even at this age, but I still haven't yeah, got a clue. I mean, yeah, and I, you know, <laughs> you you know certain things about yourself, but you don't know everything about yourself, and you can still surprise yourself, and you can still, you know, come up with stuff that you didn't really expect you to come up with, and and it's yeah. it's like running a half marathon in my fifties. Yeah. <laughs> no, it wasn't a half marathon. I'm lying. <laughs> what was it? I can't remember. 
Plus I almost two. died, but anyway, um, yeah, no, yeah, it's, it, no, it wasn't a half yeah. marathon; it was less than that. But no, but taking up running mm. for me, having been the only person at school who didn't get mm. a badge for anything <laughs> sporty because yeah. I was so shit at it, and then in my fifties, I started running with mates just for a laugh because I was pissed one night and I said I'd start running with her. And then she made me get out of bed at seven o'clock in the morning, you know, on a Saturday and go running. And I started running. And so many people were so gobsmacked that I was running that they all started running because they thought if that fat old woman can do it, I can do it too. That's <laughs> it. That's it, man. And my daughter has run the London Marathon. And she was partly inspired. I mean, she didn't say it because I was fat and old, but she was inspired by the fact that I started doing it in my 50s. Yeah. So she could start doing it in her 30s. That's it. Some humble reflections on how we look at our lives as we get older. I love the thoughts about making decisions with joy and consideration. Then, how we can still enjoy surprising ourselves with the little goals and disciplines we decorate our lives with. Humbling stuff. We had to squeeze in one more round of the game after realising we dived deeper into that question that we'd anticipated. We're joining back in with Tim. Let's go for the thing I know least about. Let's go for economy, because <laughs> my son's an economist, actually, so I can pl- I can be really embarrassingly bad about economy <laughs> now and play this to him. So, is yeah. he a donut? Eco- I like no, the idea of donut, donut economies, economist. but that's just because I like the idea of donuts. <laughs> I don't know what he's called, but he's not a donut <laughs> economist. I don't think. <laughs> uh, but aren't the donut what's economists the, the, the good what's people? The opposite of donut economist, no, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Bastard economist, <laughs> uh, Thatcherite. No, 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 I don't no, know. No, not quite to that anyway. <laughs> really okay, mean. right. Compliments and positivity have replaced money. Would you survive? Yes. <laughs> Let me think. Would I survive? Um, <laughs> If you can't say something nice, don't say it at all. Yeah. I, I'm not. Uh, oh gosh, I don't know. I don't know about no, this. I he's dead. I'm, he's I dead, basically. Dead. <laughs> I'm rich. No, I'm it depends on whether you're talking about you're absorbing the compliments and positivity, well, or whether you actually have to be positive, complimentary and positive. Me being positive. I think. Well, if it's me being positive to other people, I can do that. If it's me being positive about myself, mm-mm. Not, 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 mm. not, yeah, as a, you, not as a uh, currency, no. No, I'm not going to survive on that. No, no, no. Do you not look in the mirror and go, I am no. wonderful and I'm going to achieve great things no. today? No. <laughs> I don't either. No. Uh, uh, Do you not have those, what they called, you know, spinning your mantras, what they called? What's affirmations. The thing? Affirmations. I have, no, I have, yes. I have you actually. Must, you must I have done an to, affirmations workshop talk, in the 1980s. I went to a talk by Bernadine Evaristo <laughs> not very long ago, actually, and she was talking about her affirmation. Oh. And I did write down an affirmation about the book I'm writing at the moment, actually. But, you know, the fact that I need to write that affirmation down tells you quite a bit, really. Because by that, you know... Yes, but it also... But that's the whole point of them. I used to have one which was all about, oh, God, it was a whole book of affirmations. It was like everything. So it was back when you thought, you know, you could, uh, you could change the world just by chanting an affirmation, you know, <laughs> about yeah. yourself. Because it was completely ignoring the fact that you were probably a white middle class person who had time <laughs> to indulge in these therapeutic <laughs> weekends with a bunch of old idiots but, but i um, think i am, po- I am positive <laughs> about other people but the idea I is am good positive about other people i am positive that we can solve the challenges that we're faced with more generally i mean i don't despair i'm not somebody who yeah. despairs not not about mm, the world mm, mm. i i feel like mm. um you know we have the wherewithal to solve the problems and i have to believe that that we will apply that wherewithal um i think it's more in relation to myself that i've had trouble on with this kind of economy yeah yeah. yeah. Yes, but that's the whole thing. The economy is that everybody does it mm. to each. You know, we all say those things to each other, and that's what I'm not makes sure we it do, work. Though, do we? And do then we? you start do to believe. Do we? Well, I do yeah. try, Tim, but you're actually not listening to me. <laughs> <laughs> that that the way that just played out is so poetic, man. That's that's exactly it. That's exactly it. Like genuinely, like I was having this conversation with a dear friend of mine the other day, and like he's going through some hard stuff, man, and um. Like, I was just like, I was just trying to give him loads of positivity. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, for me, like, telling, 
I like I lost a dear friend like two years ago in a motorbike accident and um it hit me really hard because like when we was growing up we, we was in boarding school together and when we was growing up people literally referred us as to like yin and yang like he was the white version of me and I was literally the black version of him so we was like every lethal weapon every that type of thing like Aww. every every like jig was made about us and then so when he passed it kind of rocked us and and my process in that was to tell all of my male friends that I loved them every single time I saw them or every single time that like Mm -hmm. We said goodbye, phone calls, like all of that type of stuff. And it's something that I've maintained. But and my boy, my other boy was going through some hard times and I was just telling him that I love him. Like, just like, you're cool. Like, you ain't got to do this on your own. Like, I'm always going to be here. And like, when he came around to speaking to me, I, I could sense the resistance. Like, he was just like, why are you always on this love train, man? Like, <laughs> you need to chill, That's another bro. good song. That's another I good know, song. I know, right? I know. <laughs> <laughs> He was like, you, you're always on this love train. Sometimes you just need to park it up. And I was like, bro, like, how are you going to tell someone else that they can't love you, man? Think about what you were saying. Like, nah, man, like, I, I'm not having that, bro. Like, the love is going to be here forever. And you're the one who's going to have to learn how to accept being loved for who you are. <laughs> Good for do, you. Do you know what I'm saying? That like, type of thing. And, and so it was just, like, really poetic to watch you two go through that thing yourselves. Just, like, constantly <laughs> being like, I'm... Is here, bro. Like the positivity is here, Tim. You just gotta take it. Like these cookies are warm, fresh out of the oven. Like. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Con Constance, on, on that note, it's your turn to pick a topic. This is the last. Okay, I will do a run. quick one then. Do education. Education. Okay. Would you rather be able to learn everything through reading and have total mastery of it, or? Take a pill that gave you the skill you wanted, but you never enjoyed that skill again. Reading. Yeah. Yeah. I'm a, I love books. I think books are brilliant. Although I would say that reading about stuff doesn't actually give you total mastery of it. Yeah. I, I know the theory of DIY. <laughs> I know all those theories. But to actually drill a hole in the wall, you have to actually practice those skills as well. Yeah. But no, I'm a great, I'm a great believer in reading. I like things to be hard. I don't like things to be easy. I really, <laughs> I really do. I mean, there's no interest. If you, there's not real much interest. I mean, obviously, like if I want to just relax, I'll, eat, I'll read something that like doesn't take any brain power just to have a break. But by Mills and Boone, I can definitely recommend but Mills by and large, Boone. I, I, I get so much more out of something that challenges me. I, I just, I much rather do the difficult thing, really. I, I mean, the pill that gives me something straight away just doesn't interest me at all. Yeah. Well, especially yeah. if you can't yeah, do it again. I mean, the way it's set yeah, up there, I don't want so to do it might... anyway, because I'm not going to enjoy it afterwards, you know, whereas, whereas, yeah, whereas yeah, I've yeah. got a skill that I can now, you know, it's now become a part of me and that, that expands who I am and what I can do, then that's an enjoyable thing, you know. I mean, that's, mm. that's what I want, you know. Um. Honestly, such a humbling episode. Wisdom shows itself in so many different ways, man. It's beautiful to hear how youth offers loads of opportunity for learning, whilst on the other hand, experience provides opportunity to apply to a... Honestly, such a humbling episode. Wisdom shows itself in so many different ways, man. It's beautiful to hear how youth offers loads of opportunity for learning, whilst on the other hand, experience offers opportunity to apply what we've learned in so many unintended circumstances. My biggest takeaway from this episode is the fulfillment found in taking a road less traveled. So, that's a wrap. Head to the Pervasive Media Studio website or come through to learn more at a lunchtime talk every Friday at 1pm to experience the results of their passion and work in Living Colour. So, that's a wrap. Head to the Pervasive Media Studio website or come through and learn some more at a lunchtime talk every Friday at 1pm. As always, massive thank you to the Watershed, the University of Bristol and the University of the West of England for supporting the project. To the PM Studio exec team, I appreciate your patience as I struggled with second album syndrome. I want to take a moment to show some love to Joe Kimber as well. They were instrumental in us being able to get the second series off the ground. Much love, Joe. Our beautiful artwork was created by Jazz Thompson and the music designed by Joe Hill. Remember, check us out on social media to share some of your responses. Tune in next time as we get to speak to some more of our beautiful community. 
Peace. Thank you.